Welcome to this week's lesson. This week's lesson is called uh, God's Judgment of the Nations. We're in Unit 15, Session 2. My last week's lesson uh, was called God's Heart for the Nations. Uh, we were given a picture of God, uh, God's grace, His mercy uh, for all people, for all those image bearers of God, which is everyone. Uh, in this week's lesson, uh, we get a picture of God's patience. Uh, over a century goes by. Since uh, Nineveh's people repented uh, after after God's warning that uh, was delivered by Jonah, this time God uses another prophet. Uh, this prophet's name is Nahum uh, to deliver a final word to the Assyrian capital. And sometimes later, around 612 BC, God brings judgment on Nineveh uh, via the Babylonians. Uh, God's full of grace; He is full of mercy. Uh, God is patient. He is slow to anger, but God is also just. God is also just. Thanks to Nahum, uh, God's people saw this defeat coming. He gives them a prophecy about this defeat. Uh, the book is God's message to his people uh, who are suffering under this oppression of the Assyrians. And so it's to give them some hope of some sort that, you know, that God would come and judge these people. It was a severe indictment of the of to Nineveh, God's word to his people reminded them of his holiness, uh, of his justice, and most of all, of his faithfulness. God is faithful. Uh, God was letting them know that he would finally avenge all this wrongdoing that had been done to his people uh, via the Assyrians. So can you imagine what it would be like to live under a, uh, under a foreign regime? Well, I think we're getting a little taste of that in some days, these these days, but as bad as, bad as it is today, uh, it does not compare to what these folks were going through. Uh, these folks were really suffering under under this regime. Uh, as we talked about last week, uh, we're all made in God's image. Every one of us are made in God's image. And that's why when we see somebody that is being mistreated or some kind of injustice or wrongdoing, our worst, you know, we experience it ourselves. Uh, we have a a sense of justice that awakens in us. We want to see justice. Uh, even an atheist, even an atheist has a sense of justice, a sense of what's right or what's wrong. Uh, why, why do they have that? Well, they might tell you it's um, because society has ingrained that in them. Society has told them what's right and what's wrong. That's what they believe. The real reason is that they, they were made in the image of God. And uh, we all we all are made in the image of God, and most of us, you know, we live in a we live in a world that's uh, you know relatively safe. It's not it's not bad. Uh, it's comfortable. Uh, that's why many people have a hard time comprehending a God that judges sin. They 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 just have a hard time dealing with that. Uh, they have no problem, you know, with a God that is full of mercy and full of grace, and loving. But if you mention if you mention divine judgment, uh, they reject that message right off the bat. Why do they reject it? Well, uh, we often hear this. We often hear, "How can such a loving God allow so much evil in the world?" Okay, so they they blame the evil on God, and the reason the evil exists in the world is because of the sins of Adam and Eve. Uh, we live in a fallen state. We, this world is not as God designed. Uh, since it fell into this sinful state. Uh, the world is not function, functioning as God designed it because of, because of the sin that was uh, let loose by Adam and Eve. <clears throat> but all believers can rest in this. God may uh, and God does allow bad things to happen in this world, but evil will never go unpunished. Evil will be judged. Uh, God is going to make sure that every sin uh, is a great offense to God, every sin, and he will not allow it to go unpunished, okay? And, and and that is the debt that Jesus paid on the cross. He paid for every one of those sins on the cross, and, and we can be forgiven uh, by freely accepting the gift of Jesus Christ. All right, so before we get started, though, let's go ahead and say a prayer uh, before we jump to our lesson. Lord, thank you for the many blessings you give us, and Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. 
Lord, when we study your word, we pray that we learn something that we can apply in our lives to make us better reflect you as an image bearer of you. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us. Pray for those that are uh, hurting, that are ill, need your healing. We pray for that, Lord. Lord, just be with us as we go about our week. Keep us safe. And Lord, as always, reflect you in a, in a positive manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to go to um, Nahum, uh, book of Nahum, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Let's go there. Nahum 1, 1 through 6. A prophecy concerning Nineveh. The book of the visions of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Basham, Carmel, Wither, and the blossom, blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountain quakes before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. So this thing takes place about a hundred years after uh, Jonah's encounter with the uh, Ninevites, which was a successful encounter. You remember from last week's lesson, they did repent and they did turn to the Lord. Uh, Nahum says the Lord is a jealous and avenging God here. Uh, that's a that's a far cry from a God that was full of mercy and full of grace in last week's lesson. Uh, that doesn't sound like a good God, but God is good. Uh, you'll even hear people say, I can't worship a God like that. I can't worship a God like that. So they don't believe in him. They don't believe in him. They just make, if, if you know, if they don't believe in him at all, or sometimes they just make up their own God. Um, what does Nahum mean when he says God is jealous? Well, first of all, uh, God is the one true God. So he has every right to be jealous of any uh, counterfeits or any people or, or things that are called gods. He has every right to be angry and jealous about that. Imposters make him angry. Uh, saying God is jealous just means he's, he will punish uh, and, and properly defend uh, what is rightfully his. And so everything is his, by the way. So uh, he is the creator. So he has every right to be jealous, to be angry. Uh, the wrong thing to do is to try and steal his glory or, or to mess with his people. We see that in the Bible all throughout the Bible. Uh, these pagan nations were guilty of doing just that. Um, they had all these false gods claiming God's glory. Uh, all these gods claiming to, they had all, all of these powers that uh, only belonged to God. Uh, these false gods were uh, distraction to God's people. So it was harming God's people. Uh, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. We have same issues today with false gods and that we have today. Uh, the warning can very well apply to us today, especially today. And God will only put up with uh, so much before his vengeance and wrath is poured out, as it says in this, in this warning from Nahum. God's vengeance, uh, unlike ours, though, his vengeance is righteous. Ours is not. So God has the right to be uh, full of vengeance. He is the one with all authority. He has the authority to uh, to punish sin. And it's his, his authority only to do that. When it comes to executing a, a uh, deserved punishment, it is God's right to do that. And uh, so it is proper and it's the expected response for wrongdoing, uh, for sin for it to be punished. Uh, God's vengeance is administered through God's wrath. We see here in these in these verses here. Uh, the people of Judah 
They, they longed to see God's wrath poured out on their enemies, uh, which included the people of Nineveh. Uh, they were they were very much like Jonah. Uh, you think about Jonah, how Jonah was last week in last week's lesson. You know, they they would they would like to find them a nice shady spot and and uh, watch this punishment come out on on these people. Uh, what was taking God so long to act? Well, verse three tells us. Uh, he is slow to anger because, you know, it's been a hundred years. Uh, God is patient. God is patient. But look what's promised. Look what's told also in verse three there. It says the Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. So that we can take we can take uh, comfort in uh, knowing that uh, the guilty will be punished. Uh, here that includes places like Basham, uh, Carmel, uh, Lebanon, a lot of those places we visited uh, when when we went to Israel, uh, all places known for their abundance, but they would be punished. Uh, these were beautiful places, like beautiful seasides, like you see behind me here. Uh, they had there was choice cattle, towering trees of Lebanon, uh, fields of fruit. Uh, all these things were these places were abundant. Uh, but Nahum, uh, he sees a different picture. He sees a different picture in this prophecy. What does he see? He sees he sees a wasteland uh, because of the wrath of God. He sees a wasteland that's been and it's God's wrath has been poured out on these people. Uh, our country and its leadership is headed down this very dangerous road uh, that we see today. Uh, we are blessed now, but it's not hard to see where we are headed as a nation. Uh, we don't have to have a prophet like Nahum. We do have the Bible that tells us what happens to nations that dishonor God. Uh, we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, and Nahum, here he sees <clears throat> he sees the, the seas and the rivers drying up. Uh, he sees this dust storm, maybe droughts. Um, these great cities wither, uh, earthquakes, hills tumbling down. He sees all these bad things happening. Uh, he sees a very unhappy God. How happy is God with our nation right now, do you think? Uh, that's what I thought about when I read that. Uh, how happy could he be? How much more can God take before we see his wrath on our nation? I believe we're already seeing some of that. Nahum has a couple of questions also there in, in verse 6. He says, who can withstand his indignation? Uh, who can endure his uh, burning anger? Uh, does Nahum give us an answer? To those questions, he doesn't have to. These are these are rhetorical questions. The answer is no one. The answer is no one. The answer is known, and the answer is no one can withstand God's uh, his his uh, indignation or his burning anger. Nobody can withstand that. Don't forget to put some comments in the comment section if you have some comments. Also, click the like button if you're watching in YouTube. Uh, that'll help the algorithms uh, push the videos out. So let's do that if you can. And uh, subscribe if you like the lessons. Let's go on to our next set of verses. Uh, let's read Nahum uh, chapter 1, 7 through 8. Let's go there. Nahum 1, 7 through 8. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. In these two verses, uh, we get a picture of who God is. God is the deliverer and he's a judge. What are some ways we as believers should ex expect to experience God's care for us? Uh, well, he's first of all, he's provided us a comforter, a comforter in the Holy Spirit that indwells in us once we accept him as our Lord and our Savior. Uh, we have a peace knowing that God has proven his love and his care for us many times before. So that gives us peace. God has always come through. He's always, <clears throat> he's always cares for us. Um, we have a church family, a uh, family that supports us in our times of need. Uh, so that's the purpose of our church is to care for each other and to uh, reach others as well. We have a hope because of a, uh, the promise of our salvation, our salvation from sin and death, that's, uh, that hope is true, it's sure, 
And so we can rest in that. God's people in this day here of Nahum were, were given a glimpse of, of the future. Uh, this was to help them, to help them endure this difficult time that they were going through. Uh, believers are not promised uh, a life free of trials. We're not promised that at all. Matter of fact, Jesus has said we will face trials. But Jesus says not to worry. Because why? He says, because I have overcome the world. So Jesus has already overcome these sins that we're facing in our world today. So Nahum has a message for God's people. Uh, it starts out speaking about the character of God here. Uh, God is good. Uh, you can take refuge in him. Uh, he cares for you as well. Nahum already talked about God's judgment uh, a bit uh, that was coming. And God had been very patient. Uh, we see that he'd waited over 100 years, not wanting anyone to suffer uh, his wrath. So why does God do that? Because the Lord is good. He, he doesn't want anyone to suffer. He doesn't want to just punish people for the sake of punishing them. And so he's very careful when he does that. Uh, did anyone ever get this speech when you were a kid uh, prior to you getting uh, a spanking by your dad or your mom? Uh, this is The speech was, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I bet you we've, most of us have heard that. That's our age anyway. Uh, no father likes to see their children suffer. No, no father likes to see that. We also heard about how these spankings that we were getting uh, were for our own good, for our own good. Our God, our Father in heaven, uh, he knows when, when and how to punish people, okay? His goodness means we can trust in that. We can trust in his plan and not our own. Uh, trust in his actions, trust in his timing of those actions because he is God and he is perfect. Nahum also try, told the people that uh, they could take refuge in, in the Lord. Uh, we all are sinners. We're all are sinners who deserve God's judgment, yet God has promised a way uh, to escape that judgment. He's promised us a way. How is that? Well, we repent. We repent. We turn from our sin and we put our faith in God. Uh, we turn from our sin and we make Jesus our Lord, our Lord and our Savior. There's a lot of people that like to make him their Savior, but they don't want to make him their Lord. But it's it's a, a two-package deal there. You make him your Lord and your Savior. Uh, if one does, does do that, Nahum says that God cares for them. God cares for them. Uh, when you have Jesus as your Lord, you have this relationship with him that brings insight. It brings safekeeping. It brings support to your life. All those things are makes your life more abundant. And uh, it continues. It continues for the rest of your life. It continues throughout eternity. Those are things that will never end. You'll still have that relationship with Christ all throughout all eternity. God is a God of provision. He meets all your needs. But, look at verse 8 there. But, uh, before we look at verse 8, yes, God is good. Yes, God, will. you can take refuge in God. And yes, uh, the Lord takes care of his children. But, look at verse 8. Uh, he will chase his enemies into darkness. He will completely destroy his enemies. Okay, those who reject God will experience his wrath at some point. Uh, so we don't want to be one of those that rejects God. We want to accept him, uh, which uh, if they do not accept him, it will lead to their annihilation, it says here, to their end, in other words. Uh, so often we, we want to see those that have, you know, done us wrong. Uh, we want to see, see those get, get what's coming to them, right? Uh, we're a lot like Jonah was in last week's lesson where he where he finds this nice spot and gets under the shade and, and sits on a hill and he, he's sitting there watching God. He's wanting to see what kind of wrath God's going to bring down, uh, the fire on his enemies, uh, kind of like the uh, in the chosen, the sons of thunder. They want to see that fire brought down on the enemies. Uh, 
And I got good news. Uh, good news is that uh, it, Jesus uh, will come back one day. He's going to come back one day, and uh, he's coming back to judge this next time. And uh, so uh, he's going to serve up some justice. He's going to serve up some justice to the devil. He's going to serve up some justice to the devil's minions, the demons. And he's going to serve up some justice to those who have rejected him. They've refused to, to accept him as their Lord and their Savior. And so you do not want to be in that crowd. Uh, more good news can be found in verse 9, uh, Nahum 1, 9. Let's read it and uh, take a look at that real quick. Nahum 1, 9. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. When Jesus comes back for the final judgment, it's going to be smooth sailing from there. <laughs> there will not be a second time around. It's going to be smooth sailing from there throughout eternity. And so we can trust in those words there. Let's go on to our next set of verses. Uh, we're going to read Nahum 3, 1 through 7. So let's go there. Nahum 3, 1 through 7. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, and jolting chariots. Charging cavalry, flashing swords, and glittering spears. Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number. People stumbling over the corpses all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? We serve a loving God, a slow to anger, extremely patient God, uh, but he does have his limits. Uh, and that's what we get a glimpse of here in these verses. Uh, he had enough. He had enough of the wickedness and the strength of the Assyria people. And so it's, he says, woe unto them, woe unto them. And this, this word woe is used like 53 times in the Old Testament. 41 of those times it's used in a prophetic way. Um, it's used in the context of mourning. Uh, it's used in the context of judgment. And any times it's used in a prophetic way, or prophetic sense, it's it's used to announce certain doom. Okay, there's no questions about it. it this is certain doom. Uh, my books, my book says it like this. It says it's like a like a shame on you, like a shame on you curse. Uh, so shame on them, woe unto them. Uh, this was about to happen. Uh, as we stated last week, the Assyrians were well known for their for their the way they treated their enemies. They were very cruel. And that's one of the reasons that the, the uh, prophet calls them the city of blood. Uh, we have a few cities like that. If you think about our nation, uh, you could think about th places like L.A., Detroit, Philly. Uh, all these uh, cities happen to be blue, by the way, uh, with the strongest gun laws. Yet they have uh, more murder than uh, we can imagine. And even, even the local cities are, are very bad as well. Uh, the Syrians were brutal. Uh, they, again, flayed the skin off of their enemies. They gouged their eyes out. They, they uh, impaled them with these big, large spears. One Assyrian ruler even, even bragged about filling up the moat around the town there uh, with, with dead bodies. And so they're very cruel. God was about to turn the tables on them, though, as we see here. Uh, it was going to be... Uh, their dead bodies that's going to be littering the, the streets in the city. Uh, the Syrians, Syrians also had these chariots that they would ride around that people, you know, feared. They feared these chariots. Uh, it would compare probably to our modern day tanks. 
You know, if you had these tanks running around in your city, that's what these chariots were like. No one wanted to hear them uh, running up and down the streets. It just meant trouble and havoc on the people. Uh, let me reread uh, two and three there for just a second. It says the cracks of their whips, the clatters of the wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing sword, and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without numbers, people stumbling over corpses. Uh, so, so that does not sound uh, that does not sound like a very good sight. That's a horrifying picture when you when you read that. Uh, these chariots and their armies, though, were about to run up on an undefeated army, the Lord of Armies. Uh, some translate it as Lord Almighty, God Almighty. Uh, that's what they're about to run up against. The Syrian folks, uh, the Syrian people were not uh, stupid. They were they wooed their victims. Uh, they wooed them by offering them this refuge, uh, you know, this this uh, safety, if you will. Uh, they, they would sign these treaties with these other nations saying, you know, we're going to take care of you. We're going to keep you safe and that kind of thing. And then it, it, the treaties were so one-sided, the Assyrians really just were signing a treaty uh, to to have them as slaves, more or less. The seduction is of other nations and what Nahum was talking about here. Uh, that's what he's talking about, the seduction. Uh, when he's talking about prostitutes and sorcery, it's all about that seduction of these Assyrians, how they would trick these people into signing these treaties. Uh, verse 5, God doesn't like this at all. He says, I am against you. I am against you. Woe unto the, the one whom God is against. I mean, that's not a place that you want to be. Uh, not a place at all. Uh, now, when God says, woe, uh, or I'm against you, it doesn't mean, you know, he's just going to sit there. That This means there's going to be some action. There's going to be some action. Uh, something's about to happen, and uh, something's about to follow. And notice there are several I will statements that do follow. I will, okay? Uh, I will do these certain things. The last kind of, kind of sums up the others. It says, I will make a spectacle of you. I will make a spectacle of you. Uh, a great reversal was coming. Uh, they had made spe spectacles of other nations. Now God's about to make a spectacle of them. People would no longer run for refuge to the Assyrians. Uh, that would be a thing of the past. And these verses tell us that people recoiled from them in disgust. Uh, they will see them for who they are. And who were they? They were the, those who afflicted uh, others with destruction and, and, and uh, disgrace. Now the tables are turned, however. The Assyrians are now the ones destroyed, and they're now the ones that's going to be disgraced. No, Nahum asked a couple of uh, rhetorical questions here in verse 7. Who should show, show sympathy to the Ninevites? Who would bring them comfort? Of course, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, the answer was none. No one would do that. Uh, God is good. God is good. Uh, we hear people say that all the time. God is good. And he is good. He's good at punishing uh, the evil. He's good at punishing the deeds of uh, the evil people. Uh, God is also good at comforting the afflicted. Uh, God is good at providing a path to, get, uh, to grace. He's good at that uh, because we all do evil. We all do evil and we all done evil things. We all have evil thoughts and God is good. He has provided us a path uh, of forgiveness. That path of grace is through Jesus Christ, his son. And I hope you know him. If you don't, as, as always, give me a, a text or message or whatever, call and we'll discuss it further. But I hope you have a great week next week. Uh, and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Bye.